The St Andrew's Church website tells that the present chapel in Cotton was completed in 1793. The first public chapel here was opened in 1703 and was very close to the present chapel, if not indeed somewhere on the same site. A locally born priest, John Baines, known sometimes as John Kendall as an alias for safety, had been chaplain at Cotton Hall. But in 1703 he took a barn in Wood Plumpton, just over the border of Cotton Manor, and opened it as a chapel. He dedicated it to St Andrew. So before the first chapel of 1703, it was the family chapel at Cotton Hall which had been the focus of local worship. Joseph Gillow writes that the first record of a priest serving at Cotton Hall was of John Hughes, found baptising there in 1653, and that priests were regularly hidden here during raids by the authorities. This reconstruction of Cotton Hall from the 1985 study by Dorothy O'Hanlon is based on the 1838 tithe map, ordnance survey maps and on this written description by Joseph Killow from the Haydock papers. To the south it presented three gables in the post and pan style, a fine remnant of the half-timbered houses of the 14th century. At the northwestern corner of the house stood a lofty stone erection with a flat leaded roof. This was probably the portion of the house described in the marriage settlement of William Haydock and Jane Anderton in 1670 as the hall, the buildings over the hall, the chamber at the higher end of the hall, the buttery, the boarded chamber with a little closet and a chamber over the entry. The banqueting hall was a spacious apartment having at one end a huge stone fireplace stretching from one side to the other. A moat surrounded the mansion, which was approached through an extensive and well-wooded park by a long avenue from the Tag on the eastern side, and a shorter drive from a Plumpton on the north. When the building was removed in the early part of this century, and a farmhouse erected to the southwest, a secret hiding place was revealed adjoining the ancient domestic chapel, and in it were found a few articles of altar furniture and a skeleton. The skeleton would be either that of William Haydock, executed at Worley after the Pilgrimage of Grace, or of Vivian Haydock, father of the Blessed George, who was allegedly buried in the chapel. The eastern approach from the tag can be seen on the 1848 Ordnance Survey map, as well as on these map extracts from 1893 and 1911. Today, the line of Cotton Hall Lane still runs from near the junction of Tag Lane and Tanterton Hall Road and into the Hall site. This overgrown path close to Cotton Hall Farm today, I believe, is the original line of the end of Cotton Hall Lane marked by the short double dotted line on the 1848 Ordnance Survey map. This path would have led me right up to the door of Cotton Hall in this very place where I now stand. The Oxford Archaeological Report in 2003 couldn't find direct evidence of the Hall moat but notice that on the 1838 Cotton Tithe map, the boundary of the land around the hall is marked as a dashed line on its southern and eastern sides. It is also shown on the Ordnance Survey 6 inch maps of 1848 and 1895 as a solid line with trees. And that line of trees still seems to exist today. The Oxford study suggests it's possible that this boundary followed close to the line of the southern and eastern moat, and that the moat lays hidden beneath the trees. The O'Hanlon study of 1985 had already come to this conclusion, as shown on this moat reconstruction map. The six inch map published 1895 shows a small pond just outside of and touching the close line of trees around the hall. 
the pond lies close to the lower barn building. This might have been some last remains of the medieval moat, but the pond is not shown on later maps and there are no remains of it today. But there are still locals who call this ditch on the northern side of Cottonhall Lane, next to the ancient oak tree, the moat. And who is to say that they are wrong? One of the Haydocks is involved in the story of the witch Meg Shelton, whose grave is in St Anne's Church in Woodplumpton. William Haydock, the then Lord of Cotton, was a keen huntsman. Meg Shelton lived in a hovel called Cuckoo Hall in Wesham, which was on Haydock property. Meg was blamed for causing all the bad luck of the local community. William complained to the supposed witch that he could find no hares to hunt. Meg Shelton agreed to make hares appear on the condition that she be given a new cottage to move into on his estate in Woodplumpton near to Cotton Hall. She made the condition that he should not use one of his fiercest black hounds. A hare magically appeared almost immediately and the chase was long and hard. As evening came on the squire forgot his promise, the dog was let loose and almost caught the hare which saved its own life by jumping in through the witch's window. The dog managed to bite the hare's leg as it disappeared, and then Meg Shelton suddenly appeared from the door, limping, which she did for the rest of her life. She obviously got her new house, as when she died in 1705 she was buried in Woodplumpton. She was buried by torchlight, but her corpse was found back again on top of the grave every morning, and as often as it was reburied, it appeared again. Her spirit was finally laid to rest by the priest of Cotton Hall when she was buried in a narrow shaft head down so that she couldn't dig her way out. The boulder was put on top to keep her in the grave. Another William Haydock, born about 1671, was the eldest son of the above hunting squire. He supported the Jacobites, who wanted to restore the exiled Stuart kings to the British throne. The last Catholic King of England and Ireland had been James II, also James VII of Scotland. He lost the crown and went into exile after the Glorious Revolution of 1688. The Jacobite Rising in 1715 was the attempt by James Edward Stuart, the old pretender and son of the Catholic James, to regain his father's throne. William Haydock supported the Jacobites. A local diarist, Thomas Tildley, records William Haydock meeting with other Jacobite supporting squires on August 4th, 1714 at Myerscoe Lodge. Old Anglican Queen Anne had died a few days earlier and so they had a party involving a pig roast to celebrate. The very next year, 1715, the Jacobites marched into England, but government forces caught up with them at the Battle of Preston on the 12th to 14th of November. The Jacobites surrendered. Although we already know there is no direct evidence of an attack on the Cotton Chapel, it seems likely that Cotton Hall was raided immediately after the battle. William Haydock's younger brother Gilbert was priest in Cotton at the time and was said to be found hiding in the great oak tree in the Catchfield. He later spent several months in prison in Lancaster Castle before his release. The Catchfield is shown on the tithe map and is now the area of the ancient oak and nearby housing. In 1716, William Haydock of Cotton Hall was said to have been outlawed for his part in supporting the Jacobites but there is no direct recorded evidence that he took any active part in the Battle of Preston. He was unmarried with no heir and wrote his will in 1713, aged only around 42. That he died in 1717 might suggest he was not perhaps in good health. His death was the end of the Haydock's ownership of the Manor of Cotton. His will was proved in 1717 and he left his manor and other lands and tenements in Ingall, Preston, Ashton, Lear, Woodplumpton, Freckleton and elsewhere to trustees to be sold after his death. Under law, his priest brothers were not allowed to inherit the estate, but he left legacies to them. His cousin, George Haydock of Leech Hall, now Bartle Hall, was an executor of the will 
in which his own son, Gilbert, William Haydock's godson, received a bequest. But George Haydock wasn't interested in his son taking any responsibility for Cotton Hall, and in 1730 he sold his interest to George Farrington of Worden Hall. In the late 1700s the estate was sold on to John Cross of Redscar, and it was the Cross family who pulled down the hall in the 1850s. In the Tildesley Diaries, Joseph Gillow wrote that Mary Haydock, one of the later family of the Leech Hall Haydocks, used to tell her children that when she was only five or six years old, she remembers Bonnie Prince Charlie passing along Sidgreaves Lane in Lear during the Second Jacobite Rebellion of 1745. She was lifted up by her father to see the Scots pass by, and her family gave them food. Mary died on the 15th of August, 1809, Age After the death of William Haydock in 1717 and the sale of the house and the estate, the family stayed in the area and appears to have moved more permanently to a house called the Tag, which was located at the end of Cotton Hall Lane, where Tag Farm Court now stands near the junction of Tanterton Hall Road and Tag Lane. The Tag is described in the Haydock papers as the ancient dower house of the Haydocks. On the death of a husband, a widow moves into the dower house to allow the new heir to occupy the main house. The last house to be called the Tag was left derelict and pulled down in 1985. This photo is from a study published in 1985 by Dorothy O'Hanlon, and this newspaper cutting, dated 7th of March 1983, is borrowed from the collection of a local resident. It features keen local historians Molly Carroll and Margot Naylor who are trying to find out more about the history of this building built in 1741. It was then up for sale with planning permission for building. Coincidentally, Molly and Margot had recently taken part in an archaeology course run by Liverpool University. And a look at the Dorothy O'Hanlon study group listed in the 1985 report shows that there indeed they are, Molly Carroll and Margot Naylor. The tag is mentioned in a document of 1741 as having newly erected barns and stables, but Haydock family pedigree suggests there must have been an earlier building on the site where Haydock children were being born in the early 1600s. This is the title page to the first edition of what is known as the Haydock Bible published by Thomas Haydock in Manchester in 1811. It is the work of his brother, George Leo Haydock, and it became the most popular English-speaking Catholic Bible of the 19th century on both sides of the Atlantic. The Haydock brothers were born here at the Tag. George Haydock on the 11th of April 1774, and his older brother Thomas on the 21st of February 1772. This is a painting from around 1800 of Father George Leo Haydock. In 1785, at 11 years of age, he was sent to the Catholic seminary of Douai in France. He was joined here by Brother Thomas, but in 1793 their studies were interrupted when the French Republic declared war on England. The French closed the college and arrested students, but George and Thomas managed to escape by sneaking out of the town along a canal, carrying fishing rods so they would appear to be on an innocent fishing trip. The brothers continued their studies in England and George became a priest in 1798. Thomas was advised though that he was unsuitable for the priesthood and he left the seminary. In retrospect, this was perhaps the wrong advice, but he moved to Manchester and by 1799 began a career as a Catholic publisher. 
By now, the long era of Catholic persecution and penal laws is gradually coming to an end. And to help speed this change, George and his elder brother Thomas conceived the idea of publishing a new commentary for a new edition of the English Catholic Bible. That Bible was called the Douay Reims Bible, originally translated from the Latin by the English College in Douay in the 16th century. For his Bible, George Haydock wrote a new extended commentary intended to challenge established Protestant interpretations. This Douay Bible was first published by Thomas Haydock in instalments between 1811 and 1814 and became the standard English Catholic Bible of the 19th century. George Haydock went into retirement and in 1831 he settled at the Tag. This is a detail from a drawing by George of the Tag and despite the pigsty shown at the lower left he fondly referred to it as the Golden Tag. In 1839 he came out of retirement to go to another mission in Penrith. He died there on November the 29th, 1849, aged 75. After 1840, Thomas Haydock also retired to Preston. He died on August the 25th, 1859, aged 87, and was buried in the family grave at St Mary's Newhouse Chapel in Barton. This is a first edition of the Haydock Bible which is in the care of St Mary's Newhouse and I am grateful to parishioner John Bleasdale for arranging my visit to see this valuable book. A new memorial to its publisher Thomas Haydock was blessed and dedicated at St Mary's on the 15th of May 2016. John recalls being contacted by Sidney Olhausen from Houston, Texas a collector of antiquarian English Catholic Bibles and a recognised expert in his specialist field of study. Mr Olhausen was aware of the Haydock family grave in St Mary's churchyard and felt that a memorial should be created in Thomas's memory. Working on behalf of Mr Olhausen, St Mary's commissioned Devon Base architect Edward Holden and the stone imported from China was prepared from one piece of granite to include the Bible on the top. The Bible is the actual size of the real book. Memorial benefactor Mr Olhausen attended the ceremony, second from right on this photo of the day, standing next to the bishop. He also generously presented St Mary's with their own first edition of the Bible. The Haydock Bible has been in popular use by Catholics on both sides of the Atlantic, but especially in the USA, for more than a century. George Haydock's Penrith link was recently celebrated by the charitable Cumbria County History Trust. In early 2021, Joe Biden was sworn in as US President with his hand on an heirloom family copy of the Haydock Bible. The first American edition of the popular Bible had been produced in President Biden's home state of Pennsylvania in 1823-25. In 1961, the 150th anniversary of Haydock's first edition, the first Catholic President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, also took his oath of office on a copy of the Haydock Bible, which was owned by his mother's family, the Fitzgeralds. This is almost the end of my story of Cotton Hall, Cotton Chapel and the Haydock family. A manor house was here at Cotton Hall at the end of the 13th century. The old hall is clearly marked on the Ordnance Survey map of 1848, but by the 1890s it has been demolished and replaced by a new farmhouse, which is the current Cotton Hall farm. But can we put a more precise date on the demolition of the old hall? In a newspaper article published in the Preston Chronicle on Saturday, June the 25th, 1870, Newspaper owner and local historian Anthony Hewitson writes about the hall. He gives an idea of a date for the then still recent demolition. He writes, The old hall, pulled down about a dozen years ago, was a curious building. It was made of timber, and in it were hiding places rendered essential for personal security during the fierce times of religious persecution. A farmstead stands now upon the site of Cotton Old Hall. Writing in 1870, this puts the date of the demolition to around 1858. 
The censuses either side of this date, of 1851 and 1861, show that the site of Cotton Hall was inhabited by the same family. In 1851, Thomas Swift, aged 29, is a farmer of 115 acres, living with his wife Alice and three children. Thomas employs two house servants and five farm labourers. If 1858 is the correct date for demolition, then this family was living in the old hall in 1851. In 1861, the Swift family is still resident at Cotton Hall, ten years older, more children, and still farming 115 acres. But if the hall was demolished in 1858, the Swifts would now be living in the newly built Cotton farmhouse. Could Thomas Swift be the builder and owner of the new farmhouse? He is claiming to farm 115 acres, and if a football field is about 1.3 acres, then a farm of 115 is a considerable size. So they were not necessarily poor farmers. The Lancashire Archive electoral registers of the period are available online, and Thomas Swift appears in both 1851 and 1861. In 1851 he is listed at Cotton Hall as occupier of house and land of the yearly rent of £50 and upwards, so he doesn't appear to own Cotton Hall. In 1861 he is listed simply as occupier of house and land, no mention this time of any yearly rent. Although at the time an occupier could be someone who either owns, leases or rents a holding, perhaps Thomas actually was able to build his new farmhouse on the site of his previous and perhaps a little dilapidated rented hall home. By 1871, Cotton Hall is no longer held by a farmer, but is in the ownership of William Penny, a coach builder. He also has servants and employs labour. This site at Cotton Hall is remarkable in that it's been occupied since the 13th century. The 115 acres of Thomas Swift's farm belonging to Old Cotton Hall would suggest that, as well as being a leading Catholic family over many centuries, the Haydocks were also major landowners, and that they would be employing a considerable local workforce to manage profitable farmlands which now lie long forgotten beneath the new homes and developments of Cotton. That's a very rich history for such a modern, thriving and still growing community. <laughs>